I am not resigning, and it is, uh, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion. And we are simply here trying to do our job. But then there were two. Congressman Thomas Massey joining Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene's motion to oust Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson. But Johnson says that he's staying put. Now, Massey said Tuesday that he will co-sponsor MTG's motion to vacate just after Johnson unveiled his plan to move the long-awaited foreign aid bill through the House of Representatives. So joining me now with the latest is The Hill's White House reporter, Brett Samuels. Brett, is Speaker Johnson going to lose his job? It certainly seems like a distinct possibility, Kevin. You know, Republicans have such a narrow majority in the House. They can only afford to lose two votes at this point. That'll go down to one vote. Once Congressman Mike Gallagher departs at the end of the week with his planned resignation. Uh, so the fact that Thomas Massey is backing this, this motion for Marjorie Taylor Greene means that they effectively have enough votes that they could uh, remove Speaker Johnson from his post if Democrats don't join Republicans to save uh, Mike Johnson and, and save him as speaker. So it's setting up this really fascinating choice for Democrats where, you know, Democrats who have shown no interest in saving with the Republican speaker before uh, basically have a choice between saving Mike Johnson and keeping things in order in the House or, you know, letting Republicans flail and potentially seeing Hakeem Jeffries uh, elevated as speaker. Well, sticking with Republicans, though, for a second, I I'm confused because Speaker Johnson was just down in Florida at Mar-a-Lago with former President Donald Trump. And it, it, it seemed like they had squashed their beef, that they were all getting along. And now it looks like Republicans are on the verge of potentially ousting another speaker. Is that going to backfire on them? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, you mentioned the speaker's trip to Florida to meet with the former president. One Trump ally told me that that trip from Speaker Johnson was was very transparently just an effort for Johnson to shield himself from criticism from the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is obviously a very close Trump ally. Trump gave Johnson this, this vote of support. Uh, and yet here we are, you know, just a few days later where Johnson's job seems at risk. So, uh, you know, this, this does seem like something Democrats are kind of, you know, rubbing their hands together uh, at, at the prospect of Republicans in chaos and being able to showcase to voters as we head into an election in November, you know, look at how Republicans govern, look at how dysfunctional they are. Uh, so, you know, that's, I think, something the majority of Republicans in the House want to avoid. Uh, but when you have such a narrow majority, it doesn't really matter what the majority wants. Just a few lawmakers can really tip the scales in this case. But does the calls from MTG lose any credibility as the Freedom Caucus, meanwhile, is peddling a false uh, conspiracy theory about Iran's attack on Israel? Yeah, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she has sort of been threatening this for a few weeks now. The question is, will she follow through on this? Uh, she is somebody who's certainly been a thorn in the side of leadership for a long time now. So, uh, you know, at a certain point, the question is, do people, uh, you know, just say, you know, shrug their shoulders and say, Marjorie Taylor Greene is going to do what she's going to do and we can't worry about that. Uh, so she does risk, I think, you know, losing a lot of cachet in the House and just becoming, you know, sort of the congresswoman who cried wolf too many times, uh, where people just decide to put their heads down and do their business, regardless of what it is that she's going to say. So that's the politics of this. Earlier today, I was talking with some international sources uh, who work in the intelligence community who said essentially that they really just want to see aid moving for U.S. allies as it relates to Ukraine and Israel. I mean, so the, the policy fight over, over what's happening with Speaker Johnson is centered around foreign aid. Is that going to get through, Brett? And if so, when? Yeah, you know, once again, it's sort of this case where you have a minority, really, of Republicans in the House in particular, who are really kind of shaking this up, holding this up and causing such uncertainty about whether foreign aid will get through. As you mentioned, Kevin, you know, your international sources, White House sources have told me, Democratic sources have told me that they just want this aid to get through. They have stressed that there is bipartisan, bipartisan support for this foreign aid for Ukraine, for Israel, uh, for allies in the Indo-Pacific like Taiwan. Obviously, it passed uh, with bipartisan support in the Senate. There seems to be enough support in the House to get it through. The question is just, whether folks like Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, you know, will allow this vote to get through, whether folks in the Freedom Caucus will allow this vote to get through uh, without it costing Mike Johnson his job. Uh, you know, the White House officials told me uh, just before we came on air that they actually think this plan by Mike Johnson does cover uh, sort of what they're looking for in terms of aid for Israel and Ukraine. So it does seem like there's a consensus that this could get the job done from a policy perspective. 
The question is whether politics get in the way of it. I'm not sure the far left is any more united with President Biden than the the right flank and the Freedom Caucus is with Speaker Johnson, but that's another story for another day. In the meantime, former President Donald Trump's hush money trial continues today in New York. Take a listen. We have a Trump-hating judge. We have a judge who shouldn't be on this case. He's totally conflicted. But this is a trial that should never happen. It should have been thrown out a long time ago. I should be right now in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in many other states, North Carolina, Georgia, campaigning. This is all coming from the Biden White House. All right, so there's been no jurors picked, and Stormy Daniels will be allowed to testify. The judge also refused to recuse himself from the case, as Trump had asked. And according to reports, the former president fell asleep in court on Monday. Brett, halfway through the day, are, are you still awake? And any big developments in terms of what happened up there in, in Manhattan? Why awake, Kevin? You know, I had, a, <laughs> I had my morning coffee. I'll have my, my caffeine boost in the afternoon. So, uh, you know, you know, you know it, Brett, good job. Good see. job, Brett. <laughs> always looking after myself. Uh, it does seem like things are moving at, you know, sort of a slow pace as far as jury selection goes in this trial in New York City. Obviously, it's going to be really difficult, I think, to find enough jurors who are impartial uh, when it comes to Donald Trump, who is maybe the most divisive uh, political figure, certainly in the country. Uh, you know, so so that's where we're at. You know, one of, one of uh, the former president's attorneys just said yesterday that they anticipated jury selection alone could take a couple weeks. Uh, so, you know, I suggest folks, you know, buckle in because we're in this for the long haul just when it comes to jury selection before we even get to opening arguments. Uh, and in the meantime, we're going to continue to hear from the former president as we did this morning when he arrives at the courthouse, when he leaves the courthouse, he likes to make these remarks, remind folks that he feels like he's being politically persecuted here. Uh, you know, he mentioned he can't be out campaigning. He's going to use those off days, uh, on the weekends to campaign. He'll be in North Carolina on Saturday. He was in Pennsylvania last Saturday. So expect to see Trump continue to take advantage of those opportunities to speak to the camera and get his message out. All right, back here in Washington, D.C., the Supreme Court has said that they will hear the January 6th case as well. When do you expect them to take up, uh, when, when do you expect a ruling, rather, on that case? Yeah, so oral arguments uh, on this case over presidential immunity with January 6th are next week. Uh, so, you know, and actually tying back to the New York case, you know, Trump was told by the judge that he would not be allowed to miss court in New York to attend those arguments in Washington, D.C. Uh, so sort of a, a little wrinkle there, but uh, arguments next week. And then, you know, in, in the coming weeks after that, there will be an expectation of a ruling from the Supreme Court. And this is really significant because depending on how long the court takes to issue its ruling, uh, depending on what they say, that could really determine whether this January 6th case goes to trial before the election. Uh, and that's something that's being really closely watched because obviously Trump and his team are trying to delay these proceedings All right, as we'll much as possible, all... pump them yeah. beyond the election. Let's take it right back to the Senate because busy day up there in the Senate. I mean, they've got the pile up with Mayorkas and then the, uh, the Mayorkas impeachment, as well as a host of other different FISA uh, legislation as well. And then, of course, you've got uh, all of the flights back home before they head out on recess on Thursday and potentially even foreign aid. So wh wh what do you make of the Senate path forward? Yeah, busy times in the Senate. You know, the Mayorkas impeachment that you mentioned, Democrats are trying to wipe their hands of that as quickly as possible. Uh, it sounds like they'll be sworn in as jurors tomorrow on Wednesday. Uh, and then Chuck Schumer is looking for a way to essentially dispose of that very quickly. So that should be done and done uh, fairly quickly. But the FISA the FISA bill is one to watch because that's always a divisive topic. Uh, so, you know, certainly that could drag uh, beyond when senators are hoping to be in town. And then foreign aid, the question is whether the House can pass these four distinct bills or whether inevitably the House will have to go back to what the Senate passed, this $95 billion package supporting Ukraine, Israel, and other allies. So lots to watch on the Senate side. As, as you said, you know, I'm sure those lawmakers are eager to, uh, to jet home at the end of the week for recess. All right, let's get a peek at the Decision Desk HQ because President Biden's approval numbers, they're actually looking pretty good. I mean, they've, they've ticked up. He's got the highest approval rating since November. What's going on? Why, why the bounce in, in Biden's approval? You know, this is what Biden campaign officials had told me for, for a while now that they sort of expected to see that as the race crystallized between choice between Biden and Trump, uh, that his numbers would tick up. You mentioned the approval rating numbers at their highest level in a while in this poll. Uh, the New York Times had a poll out over the weekend that showed Biden essentially erasing the gap on a national level between him and Trump, where now he's only down one percentage point instead of, uh, I believe it was five percentage points just a couple months ago. Uh, 
Uh, so this is good news for Biden. The economy has been pretty strong. People are sort of coming around to that. And then abortion, obviously, as these rulings roll out at the state level, continues to be uh, a really powerful issue for the Biden campaign. So uh, reasons to be optimistic if you are a Biden campaign official at this point. And just to be clear, 43 percent is not great. I mean, it's still very, very low, but it did tick up. So just keep it honest. All right. Brett, so, thank yeah. you so much. Great, <laughs> great work as always. Brett Samuels at the Hill White House reporter. Thanks, Brett. Rudy Giuliani lost his bid to dismiss the $148 million verdict that was handed down to him last year in a defamation lawsuit brought by two former Georgia election workers. Giuliani filed for bankruptcy days after a Washington, D.C. jury ordered him to pay $148 million to Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss in a defamation trial last December. Giuliani had baselessly accused the two former election work workers of committing fraud in the 2020 presidential election. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is back on the bench after an unexplained one-day absence. The 75-year-old was present as the court met to hear arguments in a case about the Capitol riot on January 6, 2021. Thomas has ignored calls from some progressive groups to step aside from cases involving January 6. That's because of his wife, Ginny. Now, she attended then-President Donald Trump's rally near the White House before protesters descended upon the Capitol. Ginny Thomas, a conservative activist, also texted senior Trump administration officials in the weeks after the election, offering support and reiterating her belief that there was widespread fraud in the election. Are you ready for the Olympics? I know I am. The flame for this summer's Paris Olympics was lit in Olympia, Greece. That, of course, is the birthplace of the Games. The flame will head over 3,000 miles on its way to Paris for the start of the 2024 Olympics that starts on July 26th. Now, I gotta be honest, if anybody's looking for someone to cover uh, the Europe games, to go to Paris, to cover the games, maybe follow the flame on a Euro trip, I, I know a guy. You don't even have to call an agent, just call me. That's all I'm saying. That's it for today's Daily Debrief. I'm Kevin Cerulli. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel, and come on back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy and the Olympic Games.